Um, you know, I, I'm going to start off with something about the, uh, this, just say something about the uh, Justice Scalia kerfuffle, as George, as uh, Joel used to call it, and then uh, maybe make some uh, uh, personal comments about my great friendship with Joe. So the Scalia kerfuffle, right, where he gave that class the exercise to find that information about the justice uh, was done uh, in a very uh, discreet fashion. None of the information ever leaked out. And uh, Joel did not in any way contribute to kind of the store of available uh, information. And it was interesting because uh, the justice missed the point. He re reacted uh, in a very angry fashion. There's an article about it that mentions it by Joel in Loyola University Chicago Law Review, which I reread, uh, called The Transparent Citizen. So Joel's point was the educable moment, as he writes, um, was how on all of us, there is an extensive dossier that is from publicly accessible sources on the internet. And so uh, the justice uh, reacted with a kind of angry quote to uh, above the law blog that uh, questioned Joel's judgment. But Joel's judgment was I think impeccable, which was all of this information is available about all of us and any of us. And that's what the law needs to uh, react to. And in particular, as Judge Shin was telling us, uh, there is a need to protect judges and to react to the situation. So, uh, you know, great educable moment and really illustrates something about Joel, uh, which is that he was a fighter and also that he was non hierarchical. And I love the uh, story, Ari, about how Joel went up to you and during the memorial service uh, for him after he passed away, uh, which we had in May um, of 2020, I, I heard similar stories uh, from international professors who had met Joel when they were a student. And he's, they started off with a conversation and Joel said, why don't we continue it over lunch? So Joel was really interested in ideas and their value. And uh, it didn't matter if you were a Supreme Court justice Right, as in my previous example, um, or if you were a student, he was really interested in what you were thinking. Final quick anecdote, and this is going to be a more personal one, uh, about what a mensch Joel was. And, and here's a book that we wrote together in 1996 that we did for the European Commission. And I, I was, uh, I just want to mention uh, the book celebration that we had for it. Joel loved Fordham, and. Uh, we had our two celebrations for the book publication, and uh, this should bring a smile to Pascal's face as well. The first one, my father, unfortunately, was in poor health then. And so I came in from Queen, and I was a single guy back then. So I went, we had a book celebration with my parents and Pascal. And the first one was with my dad. Uh, brought him into a deli near Fordham, and Joel and I had a celebration along with then Professor Bill Trainer and Marty Flaherty. And so the Fordham family uh, and Joel and I celebrated the book with my dad. And then that evening at the beautiful romantic Cafe des Artistes, we had dinner with uh, Pascal and Joel and me and my mom. And we celebrated the book, which I think is a great illustration of uh, what a uh, Mensch was. Final thing, and then I'm going to end on a substantive note. In the book, we write that the narrow, this is 1996, folks, the narrow dispersed approach to information regulation in the United States assumes that the treatment of personal information will be limited to one context within a particular industry or company. In reality, here we go, company information practices do not neatly fit within the sectoral thinking. There is widespread cross-sectoral use of personal information. So bravo, Joel, that was your sentence. So, you know, so many lessons from Joel as a, as a scholar and as a privacy entrepreneur.
And let me quickly go through three. So first of all, one thing that I learned from uh, working with Joel and reading Joel's work is how important it is to make the right comparison. And in a sense, all law is comparative. So when we were working on our uh, projects, I held up the book before. We also did a second project for the commission of what was then the European community. Uh, we worked really hard on what we were going to compare. And so that was Joel uh, really driving forward the matrix that we would use when we uh, compared EU and US law. Our second project looked at um, diverging harmonization in the EU under the EU Data Protection Directive of 1998. And I say 1998, and Dan, just stop rubbing in how long ago some of these projects were. My gosh. Anyway, so we did the, our second project uh, looking at diverging harmonization. And uh, we looked at uh, Belgium, France, Germany, and the UK. And again, it was really, really uh, important uh, throughout to think very carefully about what we were comparing. And I see this not only, I guess in a sense, all law is comparative law, because Joel was so good at uh, looking at other fields of law beyond privacy and really was a mask of intellectual property and uh, other areas. So make the right comparison. Second thing that I think I learned from Joel and his work is uh, sticking to your vision, right? And Joel could be very stubborn and in a good way. And so I think that's why when Dan talks about going back and reading the articles and saying and seeing how much Joel got right, it's because he was stubborn in his vision. He stuck to it. And a great example for me was he predicted in an article, I believe it was a piece in the Houston Law Review, that the adequacy finding of the commission for the United States was on shaky ground. And I remember him telling me this about it at the time, and I really thought it would nothing would ever happen. And analytically, he got to that point and he wrote about it. And sure enough, um, Schrems 1 came to the same conclusion as Joel, which was that the commission was incorrect in finding that the, that the adequacy finding was correct. Third and final thing that I learned from Joel was um, the, not only the importance of having an impact or what Congressman John Lewis famously called good trouble, but I think how to have an impact. And so we've heard a little bit about this um, and, and you know, from Judge Chen and others about how Joel set up um, uh, conferences for the judicial branch, um, he also was someone who testified on numerous occasions before Congress. He was really good at finding cutting edge issues. Example would be his work about ed tech. Um, I remember as well uh, when we were doing our first report for the um, European community, how that took us on the same day um, to the West Wing of the White House relatively early in the day and um, to talk about our work for the um, uh, European Commission, which the uh, Clinton administration was very worried about. And then uh, we went on later in the day uh, to one of the few big law firms that at the time had a privacy practice. So this is about uh, 1995. And uh, Joe was completely charming throughout the day. And he had enormous energy. He also, as I said, stuck up for what he believed in. I remember him tormenting a fellow at the big law firm and voices were raised. And what was most amazing about it was at this point in the day, I was completely exhausted and I was just like barely following the um, discussion. But Joe, like the Duracell bunny, was still going full blast. So final thing is, uh, you know, speaking about the West Wing, same thing when you look at Joel's CV regarding the world. And so I had the pleasure of seeing Joel navigate the corridors of uh, the European Union in Brussels. And I should add here that Joel spoke French beautifully to the point where 
you know, French people would comment on it, how well he spoke. And so to be with Joel, either in Paris uh, or in Brussels, just really showed you how talented and diplomatic he could be, while at the same time being very savvy and emotionally intelligent about causing good trouble. So, I, I, you know, Margot, I also have have fun on my list. So what did I learn from Joel? My kind of list, and this is also, I want to amplify what uh, Ari said about community. So community, fun, and family. And so regarding community, what I would like to add is how important Fordham was to Joel and how much he contributed there. And so he played a very important role. And so I've talked about how Joel could be uh, stubborn and diplomatic at the same time. And so Joel was a very, played a very important administrative role at Fordham, both as the head of the faculty senate and then as a important vice president for academic affairs, where he got a separate office on the Rose Hill campus. So when I was trying to track him down, I had all kinds of different phone numbers that I would try. Um, and, and Dan, this was pre-cell phone days, just to date it uh, a little bit more. So he, he was just tireless. And I, during the memorial service for Joel in May 2020, um, one of the first speakers was from the top leadership of Fordham. And uh, he said that Joel deeply embodied Jesuit values. And, you know, initially I smiled because as Ari said, Joel was very proud of being Jewish. Uh, indeed, his wedding gift from my wife, Stephia and me, wedding gift from Pascal and Joel was a beautiful set of uh, Shabbos traveling candlesticks, which was just so thoughtful. And so, uh, so embodying Jesuit values, and I could feel Joel smiling at that, but I checked. And Fordham says, uh, Jesuit values are someone who leads a, quote, virtuous life characterized by personal responsibility, respect, forgiveness, compassion, a habit of reflection, and the integration of body, mind, and soul. So Joel was a Jesuit all along, and we didn't know. Second, fun. Joel and I had so much fun over the years. And, uh, you know, he, he was somebody who was completely not a snob, but enjoyed everything. And so when I think back, we had great meals in Paris. We had beer and mussels in Brussels on the, on the Grand Place, and we had pizza in Short Hills, New Jersey. And it was all great, and it was all fun, and Joel sparkled. And finally, family. So I was so touched. I, I showed you before our book from uh, the 1990s, and it's dedicated to Pascal, Jeremy, and David. And you three gave him so much joy. You were his rock. He taught me so much about the importance of family. And then at the end of his life, uh, his getting to know his beautiful grandchildren gave him such joy. Judge Chen mentioned Joel's great smile and uh, Pascal, Jeremy and David, the smiles of Joel with the grandchildren were I think the biggest smiles I've ever seen on Joel's face. So bless you. And, and again, community, Jesuit values and family. No, not community, community, fun and family and Jesuit values. <laughs>